When the going gets tough, the tough listen to Charles Payne. This is what it is. I am proud to announce this is the Payne Nation with Charles Payne. Welcome back to the nation. Uh, We have a very, very special guest uh, whose book comes out tomorrow. A political career, a Tea Party uprising, and the end of government governing as we know it. Life among the cannibals. Senator Arlen Specter, welcome to Payne Nation. <clears throat> Thank you, Payne. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's nice to have you here, and I'm honored that uh, we're one of the first radio shows you're doing. And I got to tell you, you're going to be very busy. Uh, you picked a pretty good time to put this book out there, uh, in, in many respects, because of what's going on in the political arena, but also. Over the last couple of years, you've become something of a lightning rod uh, in the political arena. Well, if you speak your mind in Washington, Payne, you can expect uh, to be to be shot at. If you keep your head below the trench line and uh, follow the party line, you're safe. But I have seen Washington disintegrate with partisanship, uh, extremism, and gridlock. And uh, I have written the book very bluntly about uh, cannibals devouring senators. The cannibals devoured uh, Bob Bennett in Utah, couldn't win a primary, not 93% conservative rating. Joe Lieberman couldn't win a Democratic primary, not liberal enough for the few people who come out in the primary. And my book uh, goes behind the scenes. Uh, I have the unique perspective, having been in both the Democratic and Republican uh, caucuses. So I know where the bodies are buried, and in this book I expose them. Um when you talk about the cannibals, and you just alluded to the to the sense that they're on both sides uh, of the political, yeah. uh, but who exactly are they? Are they power brokers, or is it a, is it a, is it a mindset? Is it a, a a an ideology? Is that the cannibal, or no. is it actual people? No, let me be specific. Uh, Senator Dement uh, from South Carolina, I identify. I name names in this book. Uh, uh, Pain. Uh, Don't beat around the bush. Went after Lisa Murkowski, the senator from Alaska. Uh, Tea Party opposed her. Uh, Club for Growth opposed her. She was too moderate. And uh, they beat her in a primary. Then she came back and won a write-in. And the Senator Lisa Murkowski story is the story that could be played out for America to break this gridlock and to put Congress back on a level footing to do the people's business. She was able to win pain because she educated, informed, and motivated the people of Alaska to win on a write-in, which is unprecedented in American history. And you know how hard it is to spell Murkowski. <laughs> if you spell it, yeah. if you spell it pain with a Y instead of an I, the ballot's thrown out. Spell it with a O instead of a U, the ballot's thrown out. But she beat the cannibals. She ate the cannibals, and well, the American center can eat the cannibals if they come out and vote. And that's why I put this book out. And uh, I don't care anything about the royalties. Uh, My whole uh, life has been spent in public service, DA, 30 years in the Senate. I'd like to see Washington function again. Now, if if she is the microcosm of what could be, of what should be, how, how, how does that play out on a national stage? Because you would, I don't know that we're ready for a third-party president. I mean, I personally, I've been a registered independent my whole life, but is the country ready uh, for a write-in presidential candidate? No, I don't uh, think the country is ready for a third party or a write-in presidential candidate. But Lisa Murkowski's story is the story of informing the electorate. If enough people read my book— and understand what's happening in Washington, they'll come out and vote. Uh, uh, Lieberman is defeated in uh, Connecticut. I couldn't win a Republican primary after I cast a vote for the stimulus package. There there were irreconcilable differences between me and the party, the party and me. But if people come out and vote, listen, there are a lot of independents. There are a lot of crossovers. People want governmental officials who are willing to compromise. When the Tea Party runs on a platform of not to compromise. When uh, McConnell, the leader of the Republicans in the Senate, says that it is the Republican caucus agenda to defeat Obama, people don't like that. Com- but isn't that, isn't that what the Republicans want to do, no matter who the president is, ultimately defeat the president? Yeah, but they all defeat him by, by having policies and a legislative agenda which is superior to his. Not to say, as DeMint did, uh, two weeks into the new administration, we want to make this his Waterloo. You, you really have to deal with the substantive problems of the country. 
and not, you, not look for elections as the sole uh, objective. You use the word compromise. Uh, that, uh, that feels like a word that's not used in, by either party. And, I, you know, maybe we could extrapolate this a little bit and say uh, perhaps this is all uh, just endemic of a greater – uh, a greater um, shift in the country in general. Uh, you know, I mean, do you feel like we're in that kind of a country anymore? I don't know. You know, uh, uh, that old Rockwellian type of white picket fence, uh, the kids out playing and they go fishing all day and they come back six hours later. It doesn't even feel like we live in that world anymore. Well, if you go to Washington on the extreme right or extreme left and feel you have to stay on the extreme left, for example, as the Tea Party does, or else you'll be beaten at a primary, as uh, Mike Castle was in Delaware by a woman who had to defend herself as not being a witch and as Bennett was and Lieberman was, you're, you're, you're going to look for self-preservation. You're going to vote against everything. But you don't, you, you don't move ahead. You don't have programs to put people uh, to work. Uh, you don't have programs to deal with, with health and, uh, national institutes of health funding. You don't deal with the people's problems. You can't have a gridlock government and succeed as a country. A political career, a Tea Party uprising, and the end of governing as we know it, life among the cannibals. Senator Arlen Specter. Um, <clears throat> having, having said that, though, um, you were, and you just uh, talked about how long you were in Washington. A lot of people feel the way that you feel, but they think the anecdote or, or the way you fend off this cannibalization is to get rid of career politicians. What, what do you make of that notion? Well, the politicians who have experience are able to deal with the bureaucrats. You've got a gigantic bureaucracy in Washington. Unless you have experienced people, you don't really do the, uh, the people's business. Uh, I think it is a very healthy thing to make people run every two years in the House and every six years in the Senate. And if you're not doing the job, uh, replace them. Uh, I think there ought to be a lot of people replaced right now. I think that would be very healthy on an individual basis, looking at what the individual has done. Uh, let's talk a little bit here about some of the chapters in your book, because uh, you talked, you just mentioned the stimulus plan. <clears throat> in hindsight, now that, now that we've had it, it's come and gone, do you, do you still feel good or proud that you voted for it? Or if you had a chance to do it all again, would you, would you reconsider? I think it was the right vote. We were verging on, on, a, on a depression. Uh, I was a kid during the 30s when we had the Great Depression, lived in Wichita, Kansas. The family moved to Philadelphia to live with my father's sister. Families moved in with one another at that time. And when I took a look at the economic situation, uh, I was persuaded that we were on the brink of that kind of a depression, losing a lot of jobs, really tumbling downhill. When, uh, uh, pre uh, when President Bush's uh, plan for the bailout of the banks and the auto companies went down, the stock market dropped 700 points. Right, right. Dick Cheney was the vice president, came and talked to the Republican caucus. 25 Republican senators out of 49 backed President Bush. It cost Bob Bennett his seat. When the shoe was on the other foot and President Obama was proposing exactly the same kind of a plan, it was a twin brother of the Bush bailout, Republicans wouldn't talk. Uh, I led the battle with uh, uh, Olympia Snow and Susan Collins to provide the key votes, which really saved the country from a depression. The economists are all writing to uh, the conventional wisdom is that we would have had uh, a depression in the United States and perhaps worldwide. And, and, that, and that incident apparently was the last straw for you or maybe one mm -hmm. of the last straws as after 44 years of being a, a, a GOP not just a member, but a leader among in the party, you switched to the Democratic Party. Well, I changed to the party because the Republicans would not uh, support my re-election effort. Uh, Joe Biden, for decades, had been urging me to become a Democrat. We rode the train together. You know, Washington, Baltimore, Wilmington. Right. Uh, occasionally, I got to say something with Joe Good. Biden. There. <laughs> but, 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 Payne, bear in mind, not until the train left Wilmington was on the way... <laughs> To Philadelphia, Ed Rendell, uh, governor, urged me to become a Democrat. I had given Rendell his first job out of law school right. as an assistant DA, and I rated high among the Democrats, and I wanted to carry on the work on funding for NIH, uh, the work I did on the Judiciary Committee with Supreme Court confirmations, jobs to Pennsylvania, 
rebuilding the Navy or any regrets at all? No, not I, not I, a shred of regret. Not, I mean, that's a hard. That's uh, like a divorcing your wife of forty five years. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, that's a serious. And people are still upset with you. I've been married longer than forty five years, uh, Payne, and I'm not about to divorce my wife uh, because uh, we both do the the right thing. But I knew when I cast the vote for the stimulus that I was placing myself in political peril. And it worked out to cost me my seat, but I didn't go to Washington to preserve my seat. I went to Washington to do what I thought was right. And uh, that vote uh, was right, has turned out to be right, and uh, uh, I'm prepared to uh, take the consequences. Uh, you just talked, uh, you just mentioned a minute ago the Supreme Court. Uh, you, you taught a class uh, at University of Pennsylvania Law School on a relationship between uh, Congress and the U.S. Supreme Court. I would, I would imagine that this particular case on the health care law uh, <clears throat> might be um, one of the greatest examples of some of the things that you talked about in that course. Right up, right up my alley. Right, uh, right up your uh, alley. How are you feeling about it? Well, I think it's constitutional. It's a legitimate exercise of the Commerce Clause. Listen, when uh, Medicare was passed, nobody liked it. When Medicaid was passed, nobody liked it. Social Security draw a lot of objections. When uh, uh, you can't judge by the temper of the times, when President Ford pardoned President Nixon, there was an uproar. It was scandalous. Now it's viewed as one of the great acts of uh, in American history of, of of healing the nation. Now you will admit, though, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, those are uh, like hanging over our economy, like the sword of Damocles. Uh, there, you know. And the thing is, at this point, to your point, people like it to the point where they don't even want to make adjustments, and uh, that could actually sink our nation. So, I mean, if you look forward far enough, uh, maybe the pendulum swings back and forth a couple of times. Well, there are ways to cut back the costs of Medicare. Uh, this uh, health care program will deal effectively with reducing costs. You can't judge the book by the cover on the Affordable Health Care Act, so-called Ob- Obamacare, uh, but uh, because the uh, current mood of the times is not favorably disposed. Listen, I had town meetings. Uh, I went to uh, Lebanon, Pennsylvania, when the thing was the hottest. I make it a practice to go to virtually every county every year. Uh, a guy stormed me, stuck his uh, uh, fist right in my face on the front page of the New York Times the next day, and uh, people's t- tempers were, were very, very high. Uh, but even at that time, when I asked people, and I had a dialogue with them, would you like to get rid of Medicare? Oh, no, no. Want to get rid of Social Security? Well, of course not. Uh, we, we need to restrain the cost of those items, but it doesn't mean that you're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're, we're, we're running a, you know, a little bit past, but this is a fascinating, and, I, and I've, I'm really honored to meet you. Um, we've talked about all of this. We talked about Washington. We talked about the cannibals, and we talked about the tough decisions which aren't being made. Will it take a very special politician to get this done, or will it ultimately have to be one political party that gets control of the White House and you know both ho- <coughs> uh, the Senate and the House to make sort of changes that are needed or perceived to be needed? Because we are in trouble, and, and it feels like we are – riding along that same path that Greece is on or in other countries? Pain, none of the above. What it will take is an aroused electorate, like the Alaska electorate, which was madder than hell that uh, the Tea Party defeated Lisa Murkowski in the primary, and they came out and did the near impossible on a write-in. And if you have an aroused electorate, you'll get a Congress which will eliminate gridlock and partisanship. That's why I wrote this book, right. Payne. It took a couple of years. It's available tomorrow. Uh, Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble are on the book stand. If enough people read this book and the people will join me in insisting on having the people vote, this country will get back on track. Before we go, uh, again, you, one of your, sec, one of your ca- chapters is on red meat. It seems like the only way people are motivated these days are through negative campaigning and red meat. How can you get the public involved without igniting or even empowering the cannibals even more? By pointing out what Senator Lisa Murkowski did in Alaska. You, you have the great word. I'm going to pick it up and use it. I'll give you credit uh, when you said microcosm. 
you got to turn Lisa Murkowski into the macrocosm. Okay.